Let's start out as we make welcome to the podium the people's president to deliver his details of his of this press conference. Please be seated. Please be seated. Thank you very much. <coughs> Your Excellency, Ambassador Omar Demagun, the acting chairman of our great party, members of the National Working Committee of our great party, the acting chairman of the BOT and former Senate President, members of the Board of Trustees here present, our most distinguished senators, our former governors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Someone asked me, what would I do if I lost my election petition appeal at the Supreme Court? In response, I said that as long as Nigeria wins, the struggle would have been worth the while. <clears throat> By that, I meant that the bigger laws would not be mine, but Nigeria's, if the Supreme Court legitimizes illegality, including forgery, identity theft, and perjury as it has done. If the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, implies by its judgment that crime is good and should be rewarded, then Nigeria has lost and the country is doomed irrespective of who occupies the presidential seat. If the Supreme Court decides that the electoral umpire, INEC, can tell the public one thing and then do something else in order to reach a corruptly predetermined outcome, then there is really no hope for the country's democracy and electoral process. Obviously, the consequences of those decisions for the country will not end at the expiration of the current government. They will last for decades. I am absolutely sure that history will vindicate me. We now know what the Supreme Court has decided. At critical points in my political life, I always ignored the easy but ignorable path in choosing the difficult but dignified path, the path of truth, of morality, of democracy, and the rule of law. I always chose freedom over servitude. Whatever the personal discomforts, my choice and tales. When I joined politics, the critical challenge was easing the military out of power so that civilian democratic governance could be restored in Nigeria. It later became a very defining struggle, and as one of the leaders of that struggle, I was targeted for elimination. In one incident, nine policemen guarding my home in Kaduna were murdered in an attempt to assassinate me. I was also forced into exile for nine months because of that incident. In addition, my interest in a logistics company that I co-owned was confiscated 
and given to friends of the military government. As vice president in the civilian government that succeeded the military, I, again, at great personal cost, chose to oppose the extension of the tenure of the government beyond the two four-year terms enshrined in our constitution. <laughs> at the current historic moment, the easier option for me would have been to fall up and retreat after the mandate banditry perpetrated by the APC and INEC. But I went to the Nigerian cause to seek redress. I even went to an American court to help with unraveling what our state institutions charged with such responsibilities were unwilling or unable to do, including, including unraveling the qualifying academic records of the person sworn in as our president and by implication, hopefully, who he really is. I offered that evidence procured with the assistance of the American court to our Supreme Court to help it do justice in this case. I give this background to underscore that what we are currently dealing with is bigger than one or two presidential elections and is certainly bigger than Atiku Abubakar. It is not about me. It is about our country, Nigeria, and your future. It is about the kind of society we want to live for the next generation, and what kind of example we want to set for our children and their children. It is about the reputation of Nigeria and Nigerians in the eyes of the world. We showed incontrovertible evidence that Bola Etinibu was not qualified to contest the presidential election because he forged the qualifying academic certificate which he submitted to INEC. In fact, a simple check on Tinibu's past records in his possession would have shown INEC that Tinibu broke the law and should not have been allowed to contest the election in the first place. We show irrefutable evidence of gross irregularities, violence, and manipulations during the elections. We showed incontrovertible evidence that INEC violated the Electoral Act and deliberately sabotaged its own publicly announced processes and procedures in order to illegally declare Tinubu elected. The position of the Supreme Court, even though final, leave so much unanswered. Even the rebuke by retired Justice Musa Datijo Mohammed is a confirmation from within the Apex Court that all is not well with the Supreme Court. The court and indeed the judiciary must never lend itself to politicization as it is currently the norm of nearly every institution in Nigeria. By the way, the strong rebuke of the Apex Court by a revered justice who had meritoriously served for more than four decades should not be swept under the carpet. The alarm raised by Justice Mohammed and recently former INEC Chairman Professor Tairu Jaga offer Nigerians an explanation into why the electoral and judicial system have become the lost, not the last, but the lost hope of the common man. Judges are no longer appointed based on merit, but are products of the interplay of politics and nepotism. Worse still, the appointment of electoral officials has also been hijacked by the ruling party as seen in the latest nomination of resident electoral commissioners, where card-carrying members of the ruling party and aides to politicians in the APC are being appointed into INEC. 
when two critical institutions like the court and the electoral commission are trapped in an evil web of political marginalization, it becomes next to impossible for democracy to thrive. As a stakeholder in the presidential election of February 25th, I, along with other well-meaning Nigerians, have done my bit in ensuring that our democratic process enjoys the privilege of full disclosure of the character deficiencies of the current political leadership. I also believe that even if the Supreme Court believes otherwise, the purpose of technology in our electoral system is to enhance transparency and not merely as a view in center. We have to move with the world and not be stuck in time. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me dwell a bit into the implications of PEPC and Supreme Court judgments. I leave Nigerians and the world to decide what to make of the Supreme Court's unfortunate decision. But here is my take. The judgments of the PEPC and the Supreme Court have far-reaching grave implications, including the following. One is the erosion of trust in the electoral system and our democracy. Nigerians witnessed at the National Assembly changed the electoral law to improve transparency in the process. Of particular importance was the introduction of modern technology to help eliminate the recurrent incidents of electoral manipulation, particularly during collection of results. Nigerians and the world also witnessed as the leadership of the INEC, especially its chairman, a national commissioner for voter education reassured Nigerians on national television multiple times that the use of that technology would be mandatory. Yet, that same INEC undermined the use of that technology during the elections and collation process and declared as winner someone who clearly did not win the presidential election. They then went further to take sides in the courts in a dogfight to defend their illegality. Who would convince the millions of Nigerians to vote in future elections after they suffered endlessly on queues to register to vote, to collect PVCs uh, to vote? based on INEC assurances, only to see their vote stolen and given to someone they did not vote for. When people lose trust and confidence in elections, democracy is practically on life support. And by affirming and legitimizing the continued lack of transparency in our electoral system, the courts are continuing to usurp the rights of voters to elect their leaders. The other grave implication is that contestants in Nigeria's election should do whatever is necessary to be declared winner. That includes identity theft, impersonation, forging of educational and other documents, by jury and violence. And as they do so, they should ignore whatever the law says and whatever assurances from the leadership of the electoral empire about what the law says and what they would do in compliance. And they would do so knowing that our courts would approve of their behavior or at best pretend not to take notice of it. The third is that if you are robbed of victory, do not bother going to cause for redress. 
because your glaring evidence of the robbery will be ignored in favor of the mandate bandit. Yes, because we have seen it. Also, your lawyers, however distinguished and accomplished, may be ridiculed by the judges who may also go out of their way to make even a stronger case for the so-called winner than even their own lawyers were able to do. We have seen it. These are clearly self-help strategies and actions bereft of the law and constitutionalism. Only lawlessness and anarchy will result from such with violence, destruction, and implosion, and loss of our country likely to follow. I believe that we still have a small <clears throat> window to prevent this from happening. I still, we can rescue this country from the strange imposters that have seized it illegally and are holding it by the jugular. Let me caution that the leaders of those African countries that have completely collapsed into chaos <clears throat> never came together one day and agreed to collapse their countries. Rather, their countries collapsed because of the incremental and compounded individual and collective utterances and actions of those leaders. Nigerians know more about the person sitting in office as their president and how he got there, and the dangers that it portends for them and the country today and in the future. It is for them, especially the younger generations, whose future are to be shaped by that man to decide what they want to do with that knowledge. Now let me give a historical perspective to the constitutional evolution that gave birth to the 1999 Constitution. In the build-up to the current democratic dispensation, agitation was rife amongst members of the political class and a large number of civil society bodies to envision a constitution that would operate a democracy in a functional order after the nasty military regimes. These agitations and necessities of the circumstances of that time led to the convocation of the 1994-95 Constitutional Conference, which I was privileged to be a part of, along with many of my colleagues here today. The Constitutional Conference was expected to create the frameworks upon which a new constitution would be built in order to make the dreams of a democratic society. A number of far-reaching reforms and recommendations were made, which drew from our past experiences and aimed at safeguarding the new constitution from the mistakes of the past. One such headline recommendation was the concept of rotational presidency, anchored on the principle of six years single term among the six geopolitical blocs. Even the notional idea of delineating the country along geopolitical blocks was a creation of the 1995 Constitutional Conference. Another thematic recommendation at the conference was that the federal capital territory should be given the democratic opportunity to elect for itself a mayor who shall emerge from popular franchise. These two recommendations were part of the landmark reforms that were submitted to the military government that convoked the Constitutional Conference. However, and rather disappointingly, the government that midwived the current democratic dispensation and enacted what is now known as the 1999 Constitution expunged these two recommendations from what eventually became the body of legislation to govern our fledging democracy. As for me, 
and my party, this phase of work is done. However, I'm not going to go away. If you think, if you think I'm going to go away, forget about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. For as long as I breathe, I will continue to struggle with other Nigerians. To deepen our democracy and rule of law. I will continue work for the kind of political and economic restructuring that the country needs to reach its true potential. That struggle should not be led by the younger generation of Nigerians who have even more at stake than my own generation. So, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me make a few proposals that I believe will help. Listen carefully. We can urgently make constitutional amendments, and I'm happy uh, members of the National Assembly are here, that will prevent any court, any court or tribunal from hiding behind technicalities and legal sophistry to affirm electoral haste and undermine the will of the people. Our democracy must mean something. It must be substantive. Above all, it must be expressed through free, fair, and transparent elections that respect the will of the people. Firstly, we must make electoral voting and collation. Members of our National Assembly here present, we must make electronic voting and collation of results mandatory. We don't want to see any human being handling our results, whether at the polling units, at the ward, at the local government. Or at the, we should all be able to stay in our homes and look at the television as the television is putting our results. This is the 21st century, and countries less advanced than Nigeria are doing so already. It is only bold initiatives that transform societies. Secondly, our members of the National Assembly, we must provide that all litigation arising from a disputed election must be concluded before the inauguration of a winner. Please, I beg of you. This was the case in 1979. I don't know how we came to this present situation. The current time frame between elections and inauguration of winners is adequate to dispense with all election litigations. What we have currently is akin to asking thieves to keep their loot and use the same to defend themselves while the case of their robbery is being decided. It only encourages mandate and banditry rather than discourage it. Thirdly, in order to ensure popular mandate and real representation, we must move to require a candidate for president to earn 50% plus one of the valid vote cards, failing which a runoff between top two candidates will be held. Most countries that elect their presidents use this two round tire system with slight variations rather than our current 
fast pass deposit system. Examples include France, Finland, Australia, Bulgaria, Portugal, Poland, Turkey, then Brazil, Argentina, Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, Namibia, Mozambique, Madagascar, and even Liberia, where a runoff is expected to hold in the coming days. Fourthly, your excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in order to reduce the desperation of incumbents and distractions from governing, and also to promote equity and national unity, we need to move to a single six-year term for president to be rotated among the six geopolitical zones. This will prevent the ganging up of two or more geopolitical zones to alternate the presidency among themselves to the exclusion of other zones. <laughs> INEC should be mandated to verify the pre credentials <clears throat> submitted to it by candidates and their parties and where it is unable to do so, perhaps because the institutions involved did not respond in time, it must publicly state so and have it on record. A situation where a candidate submits contradictory credentials to INEC in different election circles and the electoral empire accepts them without caution points to gross negligence, at best, or collusion to break the law by the leadership of INEC at worst. The submission of contradictory qualifying documents by a candidate, as well as those found to be forged or falsified, should disqualify a candidate even if the falsification or forgery is discovered after the person had been sworn into office. <clears throat> the burden of proving that a document submitted to INEC is forged should not be on the opposing candidates in the election. It is never the responsibility of an applicant for a job to prove that the person who eventually got the job did so with forged documents, but rather the employer. In addition to these proposed constitutional amendments, the Electoral Act should be amended to provide that except where they explicitly violate the Constitution and other laws, the rules and procedures laid down by the Electoral Empire and made public for the benefit of contestants and the voters will be treated as sacrosanct by the courts in deciding on election disputes. <clears throat> a referee cannot be allowed to set the rules for the game only to change or ignore them when one side has scored a goal or is about to win the match. Certainly not. We must restore confidence in our electoral system, which the current leadership of INEC has completely eroded and undermined. Also, we need well thought out provisions in the legislation and regulations to reform the judiciary, including one, the introduction of an automated case assignment system, transparency in the appointment of judges, a practice directory that stresses that the goal of judges in election cases should be to discover and affirm voters' choice rather than disregarding voters' choice for the sake of technicalities. No, sir. There should also be publicly available annual evaluation of the performance of judges using agreed criteria. By improving the transparency of the electoral process and reducing the incentives to cheat, in addition to transparency in the appointment of judges and other judicial reforms, the number of election petitions, as well as corruption in the judiciary, will be significantly reduced. More importantly, we would have succeeded in taking away the right to elect leaders from the courts and return it to the voters, to who it truly belongs. <clears throat> Gentlemen of the press, your excellencies, 
distinguished senators and members of House of Representatives, particularly members of the National Working Committee. I want to thank you for holding the fort so far as far as the party is concerned. I know there have been so many concerns and worries about the direction, the strength of the party. I want to assure that the party remains the strongest, remains formidable, remains the best political party in this country. In life, we sometimes face challenges and disappointments, but that should not deter us from pursuing the overall objective of our great party, the PDP. I therefore want to appeal to all members here and elsewhere to have faith and confidence in this great party. There has never been a great party like this in this country. So you truly belong to the greatest party in Nigeria and in Africa. God bless you all. PDP! Power to the people!